leave. You know, you're free to do that right now. Obviously, I know the lectures run a little longer um, than we had expected, but we are going to take questions for the next about 30 minutes. And my job is basically to run the microphone around. Um, I'm a research associate of Dr. Young here in the Boston area, and uh, I have been trained by him to do some work in, in live and dry blood analysis. So if there's anyone here that would like to question or challenge Dr. Young in any domain, I would be very pleased to bring you the microphone. And if you wouldn't mind to speak into the mic since we're taping this for public television, um, and also to state your name and your affiliation or kind of who you are and stand up, I would appreciate it. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, I'm Bernie Frizecki from North Reading, Massachusetts. Uh, I'm a, a, a long-time cancer patient, 15 years, and in the last 14, actually, actually 13 years, I've been on alternatives to staying alive. I have not met this yet. Um, and I do check my pH urine, and it's always very acidic. And I do a lot of juicing, and that seems to help it, but mm, it really doesn't get it there. Now, you mentioned you had one prostate cancer patient that you gave him a boost with bicarbonate of soda. Uh, how much did you do? How much did you use? Okay, so if I understand your question, you're asking me how much sodium bicarbonate do you use in order to boost the pH of the urine? That's correct. Uh, with the ideal pH being in excess of 6.8, ideally over 7.2, but in the case of any type of diagnosed cancer, you'd want to get it up as high as an 8. Okay, in order to do that, you have to get up to 3 teaspoons of sodium bicarbonate per liter of distilled water. And you need to be drinking that at least two or three times a day. Three teaspoons per liter. Three teaspoons mm -hmm. of sodium of bicarbonate of soda mm -hmm. per each liter of distilled water. Now, the reason I recommend distilled water because distilled water is electrically neutral. Yes, okay. no, I, I've been drinking distilled water for 11 years. Okay, so you, all you need to do then with the distilled water is add, add the sodium bicarbonate. And, and the way you test your urine uh, is before you eat or drink anything, you'll want to test the urine pH first, uh, first thing in the morning, and you'll want to write that pH down, and then subsequently test the urine throughout the day. The most acidic times will be around 2 a.m. in the morning, and the most alkaline times of the urine will be around 2 p.m. in the afternoon. But we'd like to see uh, that pH at least 6.8 and moving upward as, as you incorporate not only just bicarbonate, but also the green grasses and, and juices also, the green juices, rather than the fruit juices like carrot juice or vegetable juices like carrot juice or beet juice or apple or, uh, uh, you, know, the, you know, which would contain more sugars. You want to move more to spinach, parsley, celery, and cucumber. Oh. And this will help too as well. Okay, that's part of my problem. I've been juicing carrots beets, and red cabbage. Okay. Uh, those are all going to be acidic to the body uh, because of the high sugar content. So what you want to do is, is refocus, exchange your carrots with the carrot tops or the carrots with the cucumbers, eliminate the beets, uh, and then put in things like green peppers or red peppers, a little bit of red pepper maybe for the beet, uh, but then focus more on uh, spinach, parsley, and celery. Thank you. Here, you're welcome. Who has a question? One moment, please. Could you wait for the mic? Here you go. If you could just speak into that. You don't have to stand up. Right. Um, I have multiple sclerosis. And um, what usually happens to me is I get um, fatigued. Um, what do you suggest for that, for the fatigue? Probably the most important thing for any fatigue, regardless of your condition, is what you eat for breakfast. Uh, and so we have to move away from oatmeal. We have to move away from cereals. We have to move away from acidic foods that are going to compromise the internal fluids of the body. And we need to move with it to a more high fat diet. I recommend between 90 to 120 grams of fat, three to four ounces of fat a day in the form of hemp oil or seed, uh, seed oils like hemp seed, flax seed, uh, borage seeds. And as we increase the oil content and the green foods, we'll then be focusing on building healthy blood 
and also maintaining the integrity of the fluids of the body. We cannot heal up our intestinal tract by eating oatmeal. We, we have to build blood, uh, and we have to build blood with, with green foods and good healthy fats, and then move away from the acidic foods. So we need to move away from the coffee and the danishes and, and the eggs and, or whatever proteins and move to a low or no protein diet other than those proteins contained naturally in, in the green uh, vegetables that we, and, and the low sugar fruits. And one of the most important foods for you for breakfast is going to be avocado. I love one of my breakfasts is avocado and broccoli for breakfast. Now I know that may sound a little strange for most people, but, it's, but when, you, when you eat that, it's, it's energizing. When, and after you eat something, you should, you should feel an increase in energy. You shouldn't fe feel fatigued, but you should feel an increase in energy uh, driving, or deriving the, the electrical potential from that particular food. Uh, that can't happen with, with cooked foods, overcooked foods, foods, and so going to uh, a more raw type live food diet that's, that's low in sugar and high in fat, good fats, the, you know, the natural occurring fats, and then uh, this will help also build up the myelin sheath because you build up myelin sheath with blood. And the quality of that blood is going to help then regenerate your, your nervous system. And uh, th this, this we have seen in, in neuropathy. And we've seen MS reverse itself, and we have several cases of this. But we want to stop this in the tracks. What's happening right now is you're absorbing your own urine. And, and if we, we, we test your urine in the morning, I would suggest that it's probably below 6. And we need to get that urine up to those 7.2s and 7.8s and 8.2s because, because this is when we're going to saturate the tissue with alkalinity. And as we build good, healthy blood with green foods and, and green drinks and good, healthy fats, and then, and then take alkalizing compounds like sodium bicarbonate, sodium chloride, and, and use, using also uh, sea salt, sodium chloride, uh, which, is, which is essential in building sodium bicarbonate, which is, is foundational. I mean, we think about it, our blood is solid with what? Calcium, magnesium, sodium. And there's a reason for that. The reason for that is simple. Our blood is salted with sodium chloride, and also in the water is, also in the blood is water, and also carbon dioxide. When we take these and sodium chloride is split, we form HCO3 plus HCl. We need sodium chloride to make sodium bicarbonate. Now, anyone that's in a state of, of, of dysbiosis, anyone that's in a state of degeneration is deficient in the necessary salts to build sodium bicarbonate. And when we start adding sodium bicarbonate to our diet, either from taking it externally into our body, you know, uh, by adding sodium bicarbonate to water, or we also ingest extra sodium, we're going to build more sodium bicarbonate, which is the primary buffer of acid. We have a whole system devised, the salivary glands, the pylorus glands, the pancreas. The pancreas is a squirt gun that squirts out sodium bicarbonate to actually neutralize the acids, the carbonic acids, the lactic acids. But this is, this is how all this is formulated. This right here. This comes over here, excuse me. That looks like a mess. But uh, uh, sodium, sodium chloride plus water plus Carbon dioxide gives us sodium bicarbonate plus hydrochloric acid. Now, here's the revelation for you. The revelation is this, that hydrochloric acid is not a digestive enzyme, but a waste product of sodium bicarbonate production and is the cause of excess acidity in the stomach, acid reflux, ulcers, not bacteria, ulcers are from the expression of an abundance of hydrochloric acid due to the body's need for sodium bicarbonate to neutralize and alkalize the fluids because of our acidic choices. So that's why we need more salt in our diet. We need to move more to an alkaline type diet. Uh, so this is going to be very, very helpful for you. One of the things that, that many of my client patients do the first thing in the morning is they'll take like four to six ounces of distilled water, put a teaspoon of, 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 of Himalayan salt or Celtic salt or real salt, whole salt. There's a difference between salt, ionized salt and, and whole salt. It, uh, ionized salt has caking agents in it, okay, and aluminum. We don't want that. We want whole salt. Okay, and we put that in, we drink, the water is very heavy, we drink it, and we literally flush our whole system. Flush our whole, it's the best enema you can give yourself. 
I mean, everything just starts coming out. And stuff you probably don't want to talk about, you know. Uh, some scary things. And, and that's okay because that begins the healing process. But these are some of the things that you can do that are simple, inexpensive, affordable for everyone, and available to everyone. Very simple things that you can do. It'll help you out tremendously. I hope you'll do it. It's all, it's all a matter of choice. Right, I know that. Because I can just tell because I've changed my diet. What did you have for breakfast? This morning, I would say a cup of coffee. Okay. And then I went right to lunch. Okay, what did you have for lunch? Let's see. Um, I had... It was like a few hours ago, so okay. No. It was. We got to get um, the alkalinity going here. All right, I had. Uh, Can you think about yesterday? Chicken. Chicken. Uh, chicken, which is no good, I guess. Well, no, just a tell it. Doesn't matter. We won't judge it right now. A chicken sandwich. At a chicken sandwich. It was what? On, no, what no kind of bread. bread? I didn't eat the bread because I'm uh, a gluten-free diet. Okay, so you're gluten-free. I'm, I'm great. trying to get that. That's not. That's pretty good, right? That's, well, is that okay, just tell me what you ate and we'll talk right. about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, yeah, that's what I had and a uh, few pieces of uh, beef. A few pieces of beef? Yeah, just a small okay. amount. Where, where's these vegetables we, we need? Do we get any of that in there? Uh, yes, there were a few, okay. just like peppers <laughs> and onions. Some onions? And what was that, on the, on the chicken or on the beef? On both. <laughs> okay, well... This sounds, good, huh? this sounds like a McDonald's diet or something. And but then, uh, before I came here, I had chicken with, uh, like, uh, okay, what? Um, what was that stuff that your wife made? Oh, no. <laughs> I ate it at his house, so it's his fault. No. I had hot dogs on the way here. Yeah, he had hot dogs, so, so what you're saying is to change my diet even more. You have to change more. your diet. Like no coffee, because yeah. no I'll coffee. do it. I'll, I've done a lot of things. Yeah, no, that's, uh, yeah no, no coffee, no chicken, yeah. no beef. What else we got in there? All we got left is the onions right now. <laughs> you know, and onions are good, but, but we like them raw. You know, kind of we like really? raw, raw not uncooked onions. But uh, yeah, what, what is happening here, and I hope you'll receive this in the spirit that I, I share this with you, because, because I, I do it out of, out of caring and right. wanting to help you. Uh, rather than being judgmental. Right. Uh, that's, that's not where I'm coming from. So you need to seriously take accounting of how you're living and, and what you're eating. Mm -hmm. and, and I would highly recommend looking at the pH miracle lifestyle and diet. And as you incorporate these principles that I teach, I have certitude that you become a pH miracle. Okay? Because it's not about MS. It's about maintaining the integrity of the fluids of the body, building healthy blood, so you start regenerating the body rather than degenerating. Your body's in a recycle mode. We want to regenerate. And we want to, we want to get this life train going faster than the death train. Right. And we want to pick that up. But we can't do that if we focus on the condition. So if, if I may, I would like to give you the freedom, you make the choice, to break out of your MS box, if you so choose, and realize that your condition has nothing to do with MS, but it has everything to do with your personal lifestyle choices and what you're eating, what you're drinking, and what you're thinking. And that if you're willing to make a change in your lifestyle and dietary choices, that you can live your life pain-free. That you can live your life without fear, you know, of being a cripple. Or, uh, and, live, and, and live your life uh, you know, in a way that, you know, you want to, you know, being able to run without 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 fainting and and, and walk with, you know, run run without uh, walk without fainting and run run without uh, without what? <laughs> with, yeah, yeah. I mean, you'll be able to run and walk without fainting. I mean, you'll have. Period, what's that? Run period because I cannot run. Yeah. I have zero balance. How right. Weird is that? That's it's all it's all balance is all about maintaining the integrity of the fluids of the body. It's all about balance. Yeah, plus I'm on chemo. Okay. Well, I can't comment on that. These are, these are personal choices you'll have to evaluate. And then also involve your doctor, your medical doctor with this. Let him evaluate it too. And, uh, but, but probably the most important thing that you can change is what you're eating right now. Okay? 
Yeah, yeah we'd, we'd love to work with, your, with you and your doctor right. to validate this uh, uh, as, as another case study that we can then uh, combine with our other case studies that we can then present to uh, uh, Harvard. We Medical. had a question right over here, Dr. Young. Mine's, mine's real simple. Is Sean Fuller here? Yes. Okay, Sean. And the second, I just wanted to find Sean. And the second is, why distilled water? Uh, the reason for distilled water is because it's electrically neutral. It's kind of like why uh, do we use film that's not exposed? Uh, because we want, water has an ability to, to take on an impression. And so whatever we combine with it, the molecules of water will take on those, kind of like film takes on a print. Uh, if whatever we put with us, in this case we're going to be putting baking soda, we, we don't want other confusing elements or compounds in that water, so we want, it's kind of like blank film or unexposed film. So we use the distilled water, deionized water, uh, because it's electrically neutral so that whatever we combine to it, it can take on those specific properties. And that's the reason the distilled. Not to drink distilled water, but to structure distilled water. So that for, for the taking of, of the, of the, uh the formula, as it were. Uh, for taking any specific, like if you're, you're, you're going to use sodium a compound like sodium chloride to add that to the water, so we basically has, have the water as the catalyst driving these, out, these electrons, is this energy force to the various uh, parts of the body. Because the problem I have, I, I can embrace these things fully, many of the things that you've talked about, because it's in the realm of what I see is what I think we're basically meant to have is more natural diet. But right. mm -hmm. distilled water is not natural. We have to do, do something to create that distillation. Exactly. So if I take water that is what I would call purified in a different way, that has a lot of the stuff removed, but normal water, is it going to have the same impact or just not as much? Or Well, when it, whenever you're purifying water, you're trying to remove some of the larger particulates out. Exactly. Okay. Uh, so that it's more in a colloidal state, so those elements that are contained within that water can be used by the cells because basically we're a body of water, kind of a bag of water with a little dirt in it. So we're, we're water and element, and, uh, and so, so a lot of these elements within the water uh, can be beneficial if they're in the right size and proportions, uh, filtering out some of the larger particulates. And so uh, that's so that it doesn't cause more congestion. So we filter our waters for those particular purposes. But when we're trying to create something that's going to drive a specific uh, message or, or if we want to drive something, uh, a compound specifically for the purposes of alkalizing, uh, then we want to start with something that's electrically neutral that we can then impregnate with that particular information to drive it to the body. Other than that, there, I see no reason for drinking distilled water other than to structure that water for a very uh, d purpose, purpose. Yeah. very defined purpose. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, I think we had a I think we had a question right over here. Here you go. Hello. I have a question about uh, the, that taking different blood types into consideration because, for example, I'm an O positive and there are other people who are like A or B and they're natural vegetarians and O positive people, you know, with the whole blood type diet being really popular right now. It's for me. It's really difficult to be completely vegetarian. I mean, I eat a really great diet, but you know, sometimes I need to have fish or you know some beef. Mm -hmm. And what is your what is your opinion on that? Well, I'm, I'm a type O, mm -hmm. and I haven't eaten uh, meat for over 30 years. How do you do it? <laughs> How do I do it? I focus on the truth, and the truth is, blood type doesn't matter. The truth is, blood type is actually changeable based upon the context. Just as water can change to ice, A positive, O positive, I mean, A, B, these, these blood types can actually change. But that's not what's important. What's important is the environment and the health of the human cell and the quality of that particular cell. That's what we're looking for change. We cannot build healthy blood by eating meat. And the reason why is because it doesn't completely digest. Now, if you're going to puree the meat, you may get some benefit from that because it's coming out of the stomach partially undigested which causes congestion which is probably one of your challenges which is digestive and also challenges in the, in, in the lower bowel. Once we get off the proteins and a lot of the high sugar fruits, a lot of the high sugar uh, carbohydrates and move to the low carbohydrates, the green foods, the green drinks and the healthy fats and uh, specific case in point, Stu Middleman uh, was doing a blood type diet. He, he actually wrote the, the book Slow Burn. Uh, he's a typo, 
Uh, and one day he woke up and said, I'm going to run across to America. He lives in San Diego. So he ran from San Diego to New York in 57 days doing two marathons a day, 57 <coughs> days straight. When he got to Phoenix or in, to Arizona, he started breaking down because he was eating uh, the blood type diet. And I said, Stu, you've got to focus on maintaining the integrity of the fluids of the body. You're going into you know, lactic acid, lac uh, latent tissue acidosis, and you've got to build the blood if you're going to maintain health and be able to complete this race. I said, the only thing that's going to do that is for you to start eating good healthy fats and the most important fat you're going to be eating is avocado. You're going to have to give up this myth of blood type diet and focus on the environment and the quality of the blood and this is what I believe is of utmost importance. These details will not determine here again what blood type you are will not determine the quality of the environment. Only what you eat and what you're drinking will determine that and the quality of the blood will be determined by the amount of high chlorophyll content foods you put in the body and you cannot get that directly from eating beef. You get it indirectly but all of the animals eat in the wild, okay, even those that eat meat, the first thing that they ingest are the predigested grasses that are in the stomach. Everyone has to eat green in order to stay alive. It's foundational to building blood. This is what I found to be the case after studying over 60,000 patients looking at their blood that those who were focusing on a more high chlorophyll, high fat diet were those that had the best quality blood and had also the best quality health. And so I would uh, propose a, a, um, uh, a proposition here that you see what the quality of your blood is right now and the quality of the environment and see the changes that can take place inside you as you move away from beef and chicken or these, these, this uh, high protein diet. That you're probably. I mean, I normally don't eat <coughs> chicken or meat or any poultry or anything. Where are you getting your protein from? I mostly get it from from beans, and sometimes I have fish. Okay, well, fish. Well, as you move away from uh, more of the acidic foods, you know, even the legumes and the rice, or even some of the fish. I mean, the benefit of the fish, of course, is the oils, uh, particularly the super polyunsaturated fats to neutralize acidity. You'll see the quality of your blood improve, and this is just what I've found by by evaluating those who are moving to these types of diets rather than focusing specifically on blood type. So you don't find yourself getting spacey or anything? Not at all. Not at spacey all. is a result of glycolysis. Okay. If you're spacey, you're burning sugar instead of fat. We have to convert our bodies from burning sugar, you know, from being a sugar burning uh, machine organism to a fat burning organism, which is a cleaner fuel to burn. We create six times the energy and reduce the acidity by two to three times when we're burning sugar than when we're burning sugar. So we have to, when we're getting lightheaded, when we're getting dizzy, and our peripheral vision narrows, you know, our senses are, are dulled. Uh, this is a result of uh, glycolysis and, sh and sugar, ferment uh, sugar uh, fermentation. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any students or any medical professionals in the room that would like to ask Dr. Young a question or challenge him on any of his ideas? My name is Dr. Stacy Bell. I had just recently left Harvard Medical School to work for a vitamin company called Twin Lab because I believe in alternative system and does help. So I commend what you're doing. Um, of all the things you said, what I find the most provocative is this pH business. And I've been reading medical literature for 30 years. And certainly in the last six months, I've come across articles about pH in published peer-reviewed journals mm -hmm. where people are starting to talk about the diet, that it's changed over the 40,000 years of evolution, and we are eating things that weren't in the food supply before. Mm -hmm. Processed foods, you know, weren't, weren't things that we were eating, mm -hmm. and it's tweaked the pH of the blood ever so slightly. And, mm -hmm. and in the beginning, certainly when I treated patients, we, we blew off pH, as you suggested, and said, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't matter, the body will take care of itself. Mm -hmm. But now when it creeps into the conventional literature, I'm quite interested in it. And I read your book, PH Miracle, six months ago before I started seeing this and okay. again blew it off and said, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. But now I've gone full circle and I'm quite interested in what you're doing and I applaud what you're doing in terms of collecting the data. And um, having been at Harvard and conducted research, I can tell you the kind of thing that you're doing now. We're collecting patients and taking people like this and starting off with testimonials and then gathering a mass of data and being as specific as you can in terms of the diagnosis and the blood values that, and the changes that you find mm -hmm. in people's quality of life 
is the way to get started because that prompts other research because what you'd really like is other scientists to be exactly. corroborated. Exactly. Thank you very much. Welcome. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right next door. I'm Frankie Boyer, and um, it's nice to see you again. Oh, thank you. I'm a talk show host, and I go back to, um, and uh, it's nice to see Dr. Bell, who's been on my show, as well as Dr. Young. It's nice to be here, um, but I also know that the testimonials, and I remember uh, one of the shows that we did in studio, there were, actually there were some of the people that were here talking about the, the difference in their bodies and how miraculous they were. And I go back to a time when, uh, Dr. Kil Kilmer McCulley uh, was shunned and uh, was yelled at for the homocysteine theory with, in regards to heart disease mm -hmm. and how we've come full circle now and understand what homocysteine is all about. So I think that the more that we can educate people, the more that we can inform people about the work that you're doing and other like-minded practitioners such as yourself, uh, we will begin to understand that this is not just a problem of putting a Band-Aid on, mm -hmm. that we have a serious problem in this country when it comes to health care, and the Band-Aid approach is no longer working. Yes. And when we see a young rower yesterday from, Har from BC who dropped dead as he, he got right to the end, mm -hmm. it makes me so sad because I know as the work that you're doing, and a very dear friend of mine who wrote Normal Blood Test Scores on Good Enough, Ellie Cullen, who's yeah, a registered that's nurse. It's a great book. It's a great book. Mm -hmm. And we know that if, if we had a baseline of this work when we were younger, if we could only under educate people to understand that this baseline of the work that you're talking about and Ellie is talking about, this blood work, that we then can build what's missing and fill the body with the nutrients that it's screaming for. Right. So um, I commend you. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your love and support. Thank, thank you very you. much. Was there a question right here? I'm not a doctor. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious, given what you're saying in this book, does this mean that if someone were following this and making those changes and choices, that there really would be no need for any kind of uh, nutritional supplements or herbs? Uh, well, that's a, that's a real loaded question, uh, but uh, really what the body's looking for is water. When we were born, we were 90% water, we were 7 to 8% fat, we were about 1, 1, 1 to 2% uh, mineral, and about half a percent of, of sugar, and, and very little of that was protein. Okay, and, and then when we die, we're 50% water and about uh, 20 to 30% you know, fats and proteins and, and very little. The composition actually changes dramatically. What is accepted as normal is 70% water, 20% fat, 8% protein, 1 to 2% vitamin and minerals, and a half a percent to 1% sugar. Uh, here again, I don't think that's ideal. What I think is ideal is we have to go back to when we smelled really sweet and our skin was supple and that our organs were just incredibly healthy when we were a baby. And so, so the plan actually, when it, when it talks about step seven, which is you need to cleanse, uh, you cleanse from the inside out, you literally have to go back from it, it, to the beginning and start out as, as, as a baby and begin to puree your food and liquefy your food and give your body a chance to heal up the first brain or the center of the body, which is the small intestine, and to get these constipations and congestions of all this food that is, is built up there. And then hydration of, of alkaline fluids become very, very important. At 70%, I perceive that we're dehydrated. And one of the, the most important things of the program is to increase hydration to approximately one liter per 30 pounds of weight. And we're not just talking about drinking water. We're talking about drinking something that's alkalizing to the body. So it has to be structured. And so I talk about that in Chapter 7, is you are what you drink. And it's, it's a very compelling uh, uh, chapter on, on hydration. And when we're, we think we're hungry, we're actually really thirsty and, and that we should be drinking more because we are a body of water, uh, you know, with minerals. And, and, and then what happens is rather than focusing on vitamins and herbs, this, this becomes... Uh, a, a mute thing. We don't have to take vitamins and herbs because we're eating whole foods and live foods and we're drinking, we're drinking these fluids and yes we may be supplementing these things but the body has, has a way of, of creating the, the different types of elements that the body needs 
uh, which is, is just wonderful. And, and it's a new science that I call uh, nuclear transformation. And it, it's a wonderful uh, way to, to look at the way the body creates other elements uh, from just one element, such as sodium. And, and uh, so, yes, the answer is, is that we, we actually end up taking less of these types of, of, of nutrient supplements to supporting our diet because we're, we are eating more whole foods, more raw foods. So just one other follow-up question then to that. If someone were un to undertake this in all earnestness, would they start out by eliminating any kind of supplements or herbs that they're taking? Well, some of the uh, supplements you're taking are probably good. I mean, that would have to be looked at individually. But uh, foundationally, you know, some of the best uh, nutrients that, that one can take are some of the foundational ones, such as sodium, such as magnesium, uh, such as zinc. I mean, these are wonderful elements to chelate, chelate acid. And, and I incorporate those into an overall program in, in high concentrations. Uh, so elements become very, very important to the program. And then concentrated grasses like wheatgrass, barley grass, kamut grass, straw grass, dog grass, oat grass, and, and, and green vegetables, uh, broccoli, spinach, celery, and, and, and green uh, fruits, uh, avocados. Uh, these all become very, very important. And, and supplementing, which I think is one of the most important supplements, which I'm sure Twin Labs and others are doing, and that's you know, giving people concentrations of super poly and super polyunsaturated fats. And we go, what in heaven's name is super poly or polyunsaturated fats? I said, oh, well, it's just good, it's essential because you can't get it, body doesn't make it, therefore you need to supplement it. I said, I have no idea what you're talking about. And I said, what is an unsaturated fat? Well, it's unsaturated with what? What is it unsaturated? Poly means many, unsaturated with what? Well, it's unsaturated with acid. So when you take polyunsaturated fats, you're taking something that literally is like a sponge to the body that when you put it in the body, it literally absorbs the acids that are created from digestion and metabolism. So that's a good thing. You know, so they become very, very important in overall diet, and I recommend between 90 to 120 grams. Now, if you're taking a supplement, you're going, my heavens, let's see, most of these capsules are one gram, they come 90 caps per bottle, that means I have to take the whole bottle every day? You know, well, that becomes uh, very challenging. So. There are companies that actually make it, you know, like Nordic Naturals it makes a wonderful, a wonderful uh, uh, supplement of oils, uh, fish oils. Uh, uh, Manitoba makes a wonderful hemp oil. Uh, and you take it by the spoonful uh, because many of us are fat deficient. We're not taking in enough fat because we, we have this fear of fat. And so one of the chapters, I think it's chapter number nine in this book, is called Fat is My Friend. Okay? And the reason I called it fat is my friend is because everybody's got phobia about fat. If I eat fat, I get fat. No, <laughs> acid makes you fat. Not fat makes you fat, acid makes you fat. And so when we get our acidic diets in line and start more, eating more alkaline, then we can take fat on, which is wonderfully for building hormones, for building cellular membranes, for lubricating joints, for, for uh, energy purposes. And then we can become a fat-burning organism rather than a sugar-burning organism. And then we don't have the problems back here. You see? Because we don't have these cravings. I've got to get some sugar. You know, and every time you have a sugar craving, what do you eat? No fat. That's what you're supposed to eat. But what do we go to? We go to sugar because we think we need sugar, you know, because I, I, I need energy. But if we go to sugar, you know, we're a sugar-burning uh, machine, and, and that creates more acidity, and it creates more acetaldehyde and ethanol alcohol, and we end up going around like this all day, up and down, up and down, rather than if we took in, let's say, some salt with an avocado, and we mix that up, and we eat that, a half of it or a whole, within five to 15 minutes, we're going, wow, I feel I'm ready to go. You know, and it's that quick. We don't have these ups and downs throughout the whole day. And so supplementation is very important, but you will eventually eliminate the amount of supplementation that you need to take when you get your body better in balance. Okay? Thank you. Um, we have time for one more quick question. Um, and I s just caught my Wait, eye. Let's get, a, let's get uh, a youth here, too, as well. A youth? Well, he's younger than I am. Okay. You know? <laughs> I can tell. He looks pretty strong, too, as well. Um, I would like to point out that Borders and Barnes and & Noble here in Boston, as well as Amazon.com, have the book if you want to learn more about the program. It's very easy to get uh, any of Dr. Young's books, of which he has three currently on the market. Uh, my name is Alexander Mutavis. I'm a biomedical engineering student at Syracuse University. Uh, my question deals with your theories on um, 
sickness, I would say. Uh, you were talking about uh, viruses and bacteria being a result of uh, poor uh, hemostasis, or homeostasis. Um, right. Mm -hmm. Now, how does that, how does that allow for, uh, you know, the contagious behaviors? How does that allow for mm -hmm. bacterial transmissions? I mean, mm -hmm. if it's, Good if question. that's the case, I mean, uh, yeah. Excellent, excellent, uh, excellent, excellent. And, 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 and it, it's kind of like if I had seeds and I throw them in carpet, they don't grow because the environment's not conducive. If I take seeds and I throw them in, in fertile soil, they grow perfectly well. So with this caveat to the whole theory, germs can only contribute to a state of balance, but they can't cause any specific disease. In other words, I'm breathing in germs right now. Okay, they're all around us. Germs is nothing more than biological transformation of either animal, plant, or human matter, which goes airborne, such as uh, cocidiomycosis in uh, in Arizona, you know, the, all the dead desert animals and vegetation, the wind comes up and blows it, and we breathe it in and gets in the lung. That can create a disturbance in the lung which leads to co uh, cocidiomycosis. We say, well, okay, uh, we external atmosphere, out, out, our, our environment outside can contribute to a state of imbalance but cannot cause any specific condition. So if I'm in a, in, a, in a constant state of alkalosis, or if I'm continually alkalizing and providing a proper environment, then I'm going to be a part of that 20 to 40, or maybe even 60% that never gets sick, that never catches anything, because I don't have the environment to catch anything. So if we're talking about transmittable diseases, there are only, you can transmit uh, matter from one person, you know, through the fluids of the body, and that can contribute to an imbalance, okay? And if the body has an immune system to pick all that up or to eliminate it, they won't experience the symptoms of that contribution. But if there is a contribution, okay, that's going to contribute to the state of imbalance, which then can further the state of dysbiosis, okay, which then gives rise to the body going into preservation mode. So what does it do? It starts pulling calcium from the bones, magnesium from the muscles. It'll start raising the cholesterol uh, to neutralize that acidity. And all of a sudden, we've got symptoms that have been brought on by, you know, outside external forces that we've literally taken in from the outside. So I look at the at germs not as the cause, but as here again outside the body as contributors to the state of imbalance. But still, even in that imbalance, it has to be environmental conducive for it to take hold. But if I'm hydrating properly and, and, and urinating properly and eliminating properly and exercising, I'm one of those 20 or 40 percent that never gets sick because I don't have the environment to catch anything. Okay? But if I went into a room of mustard gas, which is an acid, that's going to be a little bit stronger than what my <coughs> internal system can handle. And so my cells are going to systematically break down, creating more acid further compromising my internal environment, of course, I'm going to decompose and die. So there are some strong acids that no one can overcome externally. But realizing that when we do have an infection, it's most likely an outfection that's caused by primarily an imbalance in the fluids of the body that's brought on through lifestyle choices. And to protect ourselves, ultimately, we do that by maintaining the purity and cleanliness of the fluids of the body. That's my premise here. Okay, uh, there has to be some physical or emotional disturbance. So if we're looking at Gulf War syndrome and the number of soldiers that express symptomologies related to being exposed to external environments that they may be associated with, with, uh, with gases or, or, or toxic fumes uh, from the burning of, of oil to you know, being exposed to uh, chemicals, warfare, whatever that may be, uh, there are, that, that could be a physical disturbance that could set up symptomologies and the body going to preservation mode. But also there are other things that can cause physical disturbance too. And so under investigation, the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic that killed up towards 100 million people, you know, what was the physical disturbance, what was the common denominator that brought about that particular symptomology? I mean, I have my ideas, but uh, I'm not going to share them publicly here tonight. Uh, but I think it's something that needs to be thought about. You know, did someone catch something, 
or was something was there a, was there a physical disturbance that was unique to all of these particular individuals? Was it sanitation? Was it vaccination? Was it was it was it an exposure to a particular uh, germ that all of them took into the body that caused the physical? What what caused that particular epidemic? I think these are some of the questions that need to be evaluated. And what's, what I'm suggesting here is what's not being looked at in the formulation of what is causing disease is the contextual environmental approach to what causes these states of imbalance. See, that's being discounted. To what? A predominant theory that germs cause disease, that HIV causes AIDS, and that there's some sort of trans, uh, transmission uh, of, of a condition rather than looking at the condition. For example, John Wayne. Diet of what? Not John Wayne. Uh, Rock Hudson died of what? Yeah, he, that, was his, that was what he, he, he was diagnosed with. But what about his lover? He's still alive. So what's the difference between uh, Rock Hudson and his lover? Why is he still alive? And why is Rock Hudson dead? You know, I believe it, that the answers can be found in understanding this contextual environmental theory. And that we look at it from a contextual environmental theory, they helped us to answer. Not those who just caught something, but what about the percentage that didn't catch something? Because mm -hmm. there's always a percentage that, that are exposed to something that don't get sick. So how do we answer that? And I think we have to answer it in the contextual approach. And not to, not to go around the subject, I'm, I'm just giving you some ideas or around your question, just giving you some additional maybe thoughts here that, that I've thought about too because it's a very good question, uh, but these are things that I hope that the scientific and medical community will start to evaluate. Thank you. Thank you all for your questions. Um, again, I encourage you to fill out the sheets. If you have more questions, we will get back to everyone who has requested more information. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.